Hey everyone, and welcome back to the second lecture for Physio Psych. Today we're going to be talking about a history of really physiology, psychology, and neuroscience to give you some perspective on everything that we're going to be talking about for the remainder of the semester. And just by way of a couple of quick reminders, um, if you want to get in touch with me for any reason, you can find my email here, but it's just david.barker at rutgers.edu. Um, the way that I've got things structured is that lectures are going to be released each week at the beginning of the week um, for the entire week. Um, what that also means is that the questions and assignments that are due related to that specific set of lectures are due at the end of the week. Um, so what you should plan to do is to watch one each day, Monday through Friday, but if you want to stack them up over fewer days, of course, the beautiful thing about the asynchronous course is that your schedule is your own. So if you want to sp spread this across four days and watch, you know, two of the shorter lectures together or something like that, that's totally your prerogative. Uh, just recognize that the timeline for the uh, discussion questions and things like that won't change. Um, for office hours, I'm going to set them up by appointment, and this allows for flexibility. So while I often do like setting a single day of the week, usually during a regular school year, um, summer I know is tricky. We have international students that are out of the country or things like that. And so I'm going to try and find times that work for you. That's really the whole point of this. Uh, my Zoom link is here, but it's also going to be in the signature line of every one of my emails. So if you email me to set up office hours, you don't have to worry about copying the Zoom link out of these, these lectures for the day. Um, having said that, if you need to meet and talk about something, when I say by appointment only, I don't mean don't bug me. You should absolutely come talk with me if you need something. That's the point. That's what I'm here for. I just want to be certain that we can do it at a time that is mutually beneficial and that I can dedicate that time to whatever questions that you have. So don't be afraid to stop in. The second really important thing that I need to remind you all about is to start now getting access to your textbook. Um, we're going to use the Carlson and Burkett Physiology of Behavior. Um, I've indicated the 13th edition because that's what's available, although, um, and, and of course you can get that in an ebook um, as well as there, I believe there's still a physical book for the 13th edition, even though it's been a little bit harder to find. Um, Having said that, I would also encourage any of you that want to, if it'll save you a couple of bucks, to um, grab the 12th edition. Um, you can find this on Amazon uh, quite often. I don't think that um, that Pearson is selling this anymore, um, but the course was prepped using the 12th edition. So if you're able to get access to it and you would prefer a physical book, then you're more than welcome to do it. I've compared that the 13th and the 12th edition have similar sets of material. So we're gonna be going off of those and there shouldn't be any big differences, but the 12th edition was a major update. So if you go before the 12th edition, I cannot make that same guarantee. So just make certain you have the, the 12th edition or, or 13th edition, either one is fine. Uh, the course also comes with a Rebel course package that um, has sample quizzes and things like that. If you find that those things will help you, you're more than welcome to use them. Um, I am not going to grade the Rebel material. I know that some students in the past have indicated um, in the course surveys that they do find it helpful. Um, I think that it's okay. I, I really can't get behind it. Some of the questions are actually uh, perhaps even more convoluted than the ones that I would ask. and. So if it helps you to just have more practice material, go for it. Um, but it's uh, the, I'm not pulling from their question banks or anything like that. So I also don't want to, to advertise it widely, especially if it's going to cause you to spend more money or something like that. So again, if you find it helpful, go ahead and use it. And if not, that's okay too. And as a final reminder, your very first assignment is already due at the end of this week. Uh, this assignment is to introduce yourself with a video. And so you can find this and the directions under Canvas and Discussions and the Introduce Yourself with a Video discussion, and it's going to be June 2nd. This video is really meant for me to have a way to meet all of you, to see your faces and to know who I'm talking to, especially because a lot of the conversations that we might have may be through Canvas or email or things like that. These discussions are going to take place across the semester, um, and they are only three points, but what you should realize is that by the end of the semester that they add up and eventually add up to be the same as an entire quiz. So make certain that you're diligent with them, you keep up with them, and that you complete all of them. So moving into our lecture, the thing that we're going to be talking about this entire semester in the most basic sense is what 
does the brain do? What is its purpose? So I want you all to take just one, one minute and to think about a few things that you think that the brain is responsible for. There's going to be a long, awkward pause here, and it's on purpose. So think about two or three things that you think that the brain is responsible for. What is its main job? So what I'll tell you without the benefit of interaction with the entirety of the course is that the the answers to this always range. People will say the brain senses information coming in, and that's true. People will also say that the brain controls what we do, that the brain helps us to think and process thoughts, that the brain is responsible maybe even for fairly complicated things like emotions. Um, and all of these things would be true. In the end, what we have is an entire brain filled with neurons and glia that uses both electrical and chemical signals to communicate with one another. And so one of the things that I like to lead out the semester with is to give you some idea of the history of physiological psychology. Where did we start? And how have we gotten to where we are today? And this is the biggest, broadest overview that I can give you, because I think it's very important for all of you to appreciate exactly what steps that we've had to go through to be able to now take these very complicated looks at the brain that we do today. When I think about what the brain does, I go back to something that I learned in the very, very early days of my schooling in psychology. And these are the ABCs of psychology. So the brain's job is really easily explained by these ABCs, which are affect, behavior, and cognition. So affect is really just a, a broad term uh, that most of you would think of as being emotion. And there are some other subtleties that go along with it. Um, for example, the, the amount of drive that we put behind something. Uh, maybe you could think of this as the amount of vigor in, in, in what we do. Uh, but for the most part, things like emotions or, or feelings fall into this category. And at some point later in the semester, I'm going to argue to all of you that this very um, sort of complicated uh, human trait that we think of as emotion um, can be broken down into a series of kind of simple physiological reactions um, that, that combine together in different ways. And uh, this is one of my favorite areas of neuroscience and one of my favorite lectures to give. And, and so, you know, this is something to think about is how can we take things like neuron signaling and produce something complicated like emotion? The next thing is probably a little bit more obvious, and this is a when people are giving their answers to what the brain does, this is probably the first that comes up for, for so many different people. And this is simply just the, the, the brain allows us to engage in, in actions, right? Movement in all of its different forms. Um, and, you know, behavior is a little bit more complicated than just movement, but that's kind of the manifestation that we see um, where we decide and make decisions about uh, what kinds of things that we want to do and how much we want to do them, and then our brain helps us to execute these. And then, of course, the last piece here is the C for cognition. Cognition um, is really that internal thought. Um, so for cognition, in, in some ways, we can put our sensory process into this. We, you know, perception of all of these signals coming in, uh, but it also encompasses things like memory um, or logical reasoning and, and things of that nature. So the idea is that both affect and cognition exist really to guide behaviors. So our, our cognition allows us to sense what's going on in the world around us and process that information. Uh, the affect modulates exactly 
uh, how we sort of think or reason about all of that information that's coming in and then our brain makes a plan and executes a behavior that goes along with this and so in truth the abcs of psychology are what allow us to do all of the things that we need to do in this world like to uh, obtain food and water to survive to reproduce and all of these very very complicated things that uh, make us a living organism i'm going to be coming in this semester with a bit of, of, of a bias. And so I think it's important uh, for me to describe that to you from the very beginning. I am a systems neuroscientist. And what this means is that I think about the brain as a system. I think about it as a series of connections because the work that is done in my laboratory is all under the purview of behavioral neuroscience. And the goal of behavioral neuroscience is to is to explain behavior by basically determining all of these different physiological processes that control it. So we use all kinds of different techniques to do this. We will look at what you know in this case in the case of my laboratory i should say what animals are doing um, what their uh, behavior is and then how that relates to signals that are going on in the brain and how those parts of the brain are interconnected in different ways and how those connections support different functions by perhaps processing different kinds of information and so um, not only are we thinking about uh, the behavior of what's going on or the connections, but we're putting them all together into what you could think of as functional systems. Great examples of something like a functional system would be a car. You have all of these different moving parts where the car needs to sense what you, uh, you know, the amount of force that you put onto the pedal and react by changing its behavior. And there are a lot of intervening uh, pieces in between for example, detecting just how much pressure the foot uh, puts down onto the pedal or, or so on and so forth. So perhaps not for the entire semester, but for a, a good chunk of it, I would encourage you as you're taking notes to start thinking about things as a system as well. Um, the reason for this is number one, it will put you in my shoes. And I know that one of the things everyone is always wondering is how do I get inside Dr. Parker's head? And once I'm inside of his head, how do I figure out where the quiz answers are? Um, well, they're buried really, really deep and you're not going to get a, a perfect uh, link to them. But what I can tell you is if you start to ask these questions early on and just start to think of the brain as a system where you say, okay, we're talking about some topic here, maybe the visual system. What is the input and uh, where does it come from? What cells are processing it? Um, and then what kind of processing happens? So how are different types of information uh, sorted um, and specifically processed by a certain part of the brain? And then what's the output? Um, and this can take all kinds of different forms. This can be at the, the level of a single neuron where the input is some kind of uh, neurochemical or neurotransmitter that the neuron receives and then it decides whether or not to fire an action potential in this processing step and if it does fire an action potential it releases its own neurochemical or neurotransmitter to the next neuron and, and completes the loop so this can happen at the single neuron level uh, it can also happen at the level of the entire body and brain right this can this can be kind of you know micro as i was just saying or it can be very macro where you put your hand onto a hot stove for example uh, and you sense this and then your brain processes that this is painful um, or your spinal cord in some cases does all the processing for you and it tells you that you need to move your hand out of the way because you shouldn't do that. but before we get into all of that we need to have some understanding of how we got here how did we get to the point where we can look at the brain in the way that we do now and when we look at functional systems we're really looking at multiple pieces at the same time almost a part of being human is this desire to explain behavior and there have been so many theories for this that have been proposed over time. 
one of the things that we have to talk about at the very beginning is the difference between two of the earliest theories, which are dualism and monism. And in case I haven't said it already, which I don't think that I have, um, for those of you that are interested, a lot of what I'm talking about today comes from both my own kind of favorite examples, as well as some of the things that come out of uh, chapter one of the book. Um, and none of what we're talking about is something that you're going to be tested on. I just want to give you this very early foundation in neuroscience and give you an idea of, again, how we got here. So dualism is basically the idea that our bodies are physical, but that the soul is not. And monism is this idea that the world consists only of matter and energy, and that the mind is a phenomenon produced by the workings of the nervous system. So that these functions uh, of the brain are basically a matter of energy coming in, energy within the brain processing in it, and energy going out. So this brings us to a, a very important point. We're going to talk about different points where, where people had idea of what the brain did and how exactly the functions were carried out. Um, but we can address all of these things that we can measure um, and we can look at the theories of what the brain can do. Um, but that doesn't necessarily mean that we are able to exclude this possibility that some aspect of dualism um, exists. And so, you know, this is my very early in the semester disclaimer that what we're going to talk about in this course are things that are physiological in nature and that we can measure. And that just because we're in a class that's talking about physiology and science uh, doesn't mean that we are going to sit around and discredit things like the soul or others' beliefs or, or anything of that nature. Um, and in the earliest days of science, these ideas are often intertwined. And then after that, they become very, very separated um, into the idea that mostly what we're looking at is sort of a, a monism-based perspective. We're looking at just what's happening within the nervous system, the things that we can measure, and and whether that is behavior or functions of the brain or things like that. So beyond that, we'll, we'll leave the idea of dualism alone, um, that potentially there still is some separation between these two things. Um, and one thing any good scientist knows is that uh, the absence of evidence is not proof of absence. Some of the earliest representations of the brain come from the ancient Egyptians. This is, in fact, where we see the first representation of the brain in language. And so, at least in theory, I'm no expert in ancient hieroglyphics. The picture that you're all seeing on the screen in front of you is the first representation in language of the concept of the brain. Now, while the ancient Egyptians seemed very, very aware that the brain exists, in fact, we, we know that this was one of the organs that they processed um, as part of mummification. So they're aware that there is some sort of tissue inside of the head um, and had a word for what this is. Um, they, in fact, thought that the, the seed of the soul was, in fact, the heart. Now, Probably a really important thing to say here is that this is not just something the ancient Egyptians have decided, but they are in fact all this time, along with others, um, engaging in the process of scientific observation. So for Egyptians, I guarantee that they see that if something happens to the heart, that the, the essence of the human being that had been in front of them leaves, right? And we, we know this to be true. We have to have quite a few of our organs working together to uh, keep us alive. And so, you know, for them, when they when they see something happen to the heart, you, you see the, the person that had been in front of you and all of their behaviors and emotions and everything that, that makes them up leave the world as well. And this idea sticks around for a very, very long time and is finally uh, challenged, if you will, by the early philosophers. This is 
around 460 BC, close to 1200 years later, uh, Hippocrates is one of the first people to assert that no, instead the brain and the, is the, the seat for all of these thought and emotion things. And while this might have been the beginning of the change of this argument, the argument would go on for an incredibly long time. Because despite the fact that Hippocrates might have had a slightly different observation, right? People are starting to think about this more. They've probably seen people with damage to their heads and they start to recognize that this might make somebody slightly irrational. We have more, more wars and different types of specific injuries and all these kinds of things. Um, the, there's still this idea, even to this day actually, of, of exactly how the brain does all of these thought and emotion things. One of the earliest people to propose how was among the kind of later philosophers to come along. And Descartes suggests that uh, the brain is, is a sense organ. And it's very interesting the way that Descartes begins to think of this because he's one of the first people to propose the brain as being kind of a, a machine that's going to um, control behavior in the environment uh, by taking information from, from some sort of you know, stimulus in the environment. However, Descartes was a dualist. So he really thought that the, the idea of the, the soul and the mind were separate from the body. And part of what we think might have happened is that Descartes noticed from looking perhaps at brains um, that there are fluid channels inside the brain. And what he believed was that uh, these channels would change depending on what happened in the environment around somebody. And so in some ways he's taken the very complex system that is the brain and he's turned it into a system not too different than the brakes in your car where someone presses down on the pedal, in this case the body, and this changes the fluid pressure in the system and then the, the car now has to respond um, depending on, on what's happening. So he's turned the brain into this hydraulic system, probably from seeing these big fluid channels and thinking, oh, those are a, a huge structure inside the brain, that fluid must be in something. One of the first people to, to show that Descartes can't really be right in, in two different terms um, is a scientist named Galvani who, in a very simple experiment, shows something quite profound. What Galvani does is he takes the legs of dead frogs and he stimulates them with a little bit of electricity. And when he does this, the legs of the frog will twitch. And there's a couple of important things here that take Descartes' theory for a ride. The first is that these frogs are dead. So even if you were to take uh, a dualist perspective, it shows that the brain can function independently, that these electrical signals uh, don't need to be transmitted up to some sort of um, hierarchical you know, mind or soul uh, that, that helps to make decisions. So um, there's a physiological feature here that can function independently. And the second thing that Galvani shows, which is going to become incredibly important for so many things moving forward, is that electrical signals are very important signals for uh, what the brain and body do. And this gets extended by another scientist many years later named Johannes Mulier, who shows, in fact, that the type of signal coming through matters a whole lot. Because what Mulier shows is that the signals are not just, it's not just that any electrical signal matters, but um, the signals actually change a little bit or the perception of what the information coming from those signals might be changes a little bit, depending on where the signal comes from. So what this means is that a, an electrical signal coming from the eye um, might be perceived as some sort of luminous event, um, as he called it. Um, and a signal from the skin is going to per be perceived something like touch. And so 
these two concepts together bring us to some things we're going to be talking about throughout the semester. One of them is, is functionalism, where specific parts of the body and brain are aligned with certain um, certain functions, right? We have different systems, if you will, um, as we've been talking about them for sensation and for, for our motor system. And in fact, all of you can do um, an experiment that you've probably done accidentally um, a, a thousand times in your life, where if you just take a second right now and bear with me, yes, actually do this. I know you're sitting at home. You're like, well, I don't have to participate. This is an asynchronous class. No, no. Stop for a second and close your eyes. And then what I want you to do is to, without poking yourself too hard, you know your own limits, to just put pressure in different parts of your eye and then let it go, right? Just push into your eyeball just a little bit. And you might have to try a few spots. Some people have areas that are more sensitive than others. But at some point, you're going to see something that very much looks like a change in color. Some people see it better when they push in and then let go. Some people when they first push in. Um, but you've all kind of had this sort of phantom visual stimulus whenever you rub your eye and you've done this, as I said, thousands if not millions of times across your lifetime. And this is just a very simple demonstration of exactly what Moyer found, which is that if you even do something non-visual to your eye, if you put pressure on your eye, you can cause the neurons to change the way that they're firing and create something that for you, of course, you also feel touch, but you can create this sort of sp specific nerve energy that's visual because all of what you're doing is related to your visual system. And those nerves carry information that the brain sort of mistakenly perceives as being something visual. One of the major pushes in the idea of functionalism begins around 1815, and in fact would carry through to uh, probably the late 1900s. Um, and this began with a scientist named Pierre Florenz, who begins studying uh, behavior in rabbits and pigeons and other small animals um, using a technique called experimental ablation, which is just a really fancy way of saying that Florenz went around creating little bits of brain damage in a bunch of, of small animals. But what he learned from this is really important. And he was investigating this idea of, of functionalism or locationism, um, where he wants to be able to not only attribute different bits of function to different parts of the body, which is what you see with something like the retina, that if you send signals in that they, they represent kind of the specific um, sensory system, but but also that other kinds of function are, are located in specific parts of the brain. So what Florenz is doing is in many ways what Moliere did, but in reverse. He is now causing damage to different parts of the brain and saying, ah, now, you know, an animal can no longer uh, see or, or can no longer hear or things like that. And this is pretty much the first time that we convincingly begin to see that there are divisions in the brain that represent different functions. Now this continues for a long time, but probably part of the reason that it continues is that you end up getting sort of the physician scientists into the mix. And so while Florenz gives these early representations um, and, and begins to find that, you know, there are certain areas that we need for um, movement and judgment and even, even for um, basic functions that control life itself, like in the brainstem, when we have the physicians jump in, they begin to see that in humans for the first time, the damage to certain parts of the brain from natural circumstances can, can cause very realistic functional deficits. And one of the earliest pioneers of this, who's a famous uh, kind of case in psychology is Paul Broca. Um, so around 1861, Paul Broca visits this patient named Louis Victor Laborn, and what um, what he finds is that this this person, Laborn, has had kind of a progressive loss of speech um, and, and basically a paralysis of his speech, but he can still comprehend things just fine. So he has a very specific loss of function. And 
I guess as luck would have it for Paul Broca, but not for LeBorn, um, LeBorn dies a few days later uh, because of an infection. And so Broca performs an autopsy. And of, the idea here is, of course, to find some clues as to, to how LeBorn died. Uh, but as a part of this, he looks at the brain and he he finds that there's this very specific point of damage in the brain. And as we'll talk about later in the semester, he goes on to uh, to determine that this damage uh, exists in many other patients and that, yes, in fact, in humans, that we have this very specific relationship between parts of the brain um, and that the damage, um, you know, and then damage in those parts of the brain can cause a very specific functional deficit, I guess, is what I'm trying to say here. So moving forward, we have two more major discoveries in the world of electrical stimulation. And the first of these is very much in line with what Florenz and Paul Broca are doing, where two scientists, Fritz and Heisig, um, show that just like stimulating the nerves of the leg of a dead frog, that if you create some kind of electrical stimulation in certain parts of the brain, that you can actually make movements in parts of the body. And so this kind of completes the loop of all of these different things. But not too far off from this, um, and in something that many people don't even consider in the history of physiological psychology, but became very important, is a scientist named Hemholtz, um, who's really more of a physicist, comes up with this incredibly crazy contraption. You can see the diagram here on your screen. Um, and what he shows with this contraption, which which is well ahead of its time, um, is that there's there's a bit of a problem with this idea of thinking that uh, everything in the brain operates on electrical signals. Because what he does is he he's a very good physicist and he knows what the timing of an electrical signal going from one point to another should be. And he can measure this in a piece of wire and, and say, if I if I send the signal from, from A to B, it should take, uh, you know, exactly 24 point six milliseconds or it should travel at 24.6 meters per second um, and should be no longer than 38.4 meters per second. So Hemholt sets up this very elaborate contraption and then what he does is he fits a nerve into the middle as one of these wires and and what he finds is that the time that it takes for a signal to actually get from one point to the other is quite far delayed. In fact, too far delayed, well outside of what his calculations could be. And he tests this over and over and over again uh, using this device that's projecting some of these signals onto walls and all kinds of things like this. And, 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 and so he has this first record of this. And what he ends up concluding from this is incredibly simple and yet is one of the most foundational ideas in modern neuroscience, which is that there is some intermediate process happening in the nerves. And this is really the foundation uh, for what he didn't know at the time is the idea of chemical messaging because all of the nerves in your body signal use, using two different kinds of signal. Of course, first there's an electrical signal that allows um, information to get from point A to point B very, very quickly. But then this changes into a chemical signal that allows us to uh, translate from one neuron to another uh, in some some information about the magnitude of the signal and allows the brain to be very modular in that we can we can turn up or down the volume on certain nerves at different points in time and that becomes very important for brain function also around this time um, all kind of amid the the mid to late 1800s, we begin getting incredibly beautiful diagrams from Santiago Ramón y Cajal, who comes across a type of staining that we now refer to as Golgi staining um, 
to begin looking at the brain and and Ramon y Cajal would eventually win the Nobel Prize for this work. Um, but he gets kind of lucky in some way because this Golgi staining accidentally stains a few neurons at a time. It will stain some and skip others. And we it, it took us a very long time to understand why and the details don't matter. But what matters for all of these anatomical drawings is that it allows Cajal to create these beautiful diagrams of all different kinds of neurons in the brain. And by having these pictures of different neurons, he begins to see that there is a different anatomical organization of the brain, where some parts of the brain have neurons that are big and others small, and some that have all kinds of huge arms coming off of them, like a thousand arm octopus, and others that are very simple. And so this is really the beginning of starting to look at all of these functional studies with an anatomical point of view, because what Cajal shows us is that there are billions of different neurons, but that also these neurons are not all the same, that the brain is comprised of many different qualities of neurons. Then we enter into the 1900s for the first time, and this in another Nobel Prize winning discovery, Hodgkin and Huxley discovered that nerves conduct messages and that there, there's a physiological process to this that we now call the action potential. So they use the giant axon of a squid, not to be confused with a giant squid axon, but the giant axon of a squid in order to be able to conduct some of the first recordings where they record this electrical signal. And they find that there's this process where uh, the cell generates this large electrical burst and that this action potential um, is able to send a signal over very, very long distances uh, along an axon. Also around this time, a set of scientists, Ecclesdale, Katz, Louis, and Axelrod begin this incredibly long but famous debate that eventually leads to the discovery of what had been indicated by this, this weird contraption uh, that we just talked about, that the, uh, suggesting that there's this missing component to the signals of the brain. And this multi-decade argument was basically over whether or not neurons do in fact only use electrical signals or whether or not there's some sort of a chemical signals. And Eccles, who is one of the primary players in this debate, so strongly believed that the transmission was electrical. And he designed an entire career's worth of experiments to try and figure this out. But the fa my favorite thing about the story of, of Eccles and his, his argument with, with all of these other scientists um, was that he's a true scientist scientist. And so somewhere around 1951, uh, he, he conducts an experiment that effectively proves the existence of chemical messengers. And so uh, despite setting out with this hypothesis that the brain only worked using electrical signals, he designs this great experiment um, and, and both discovers the neurotransmitter, the first neurotransmitter, um, acetylcholine without knowing it, and also changes his stance and for the first time settles on the idea that the brain does in fact use both electrical and chemical signals. Important for modern day behavioral neuroscience where we start to take the physiology and behavior and other things and start putting them together um, is somewhere also in this era around 1940 is when we start to see the emergence of biopsychology or behavioral psychology. And this really begins in a simple way that you probably have all tried to forget since Psych 101 uh, not all too long ago. Um, so around 1940, B.F. Skinner publishes the the behavior of organisms, um, which is really a foundation uh, for 
what will eventually become a merging of, of behavioral psychology and neuroscience together into the, the modern field that most of us would just think of as behavioral neuroscience or, or neuroscience or, or physiological psychology is kind of another way of, of saying this. So we begin to push all of these ideas together, and part of this is influenced by B.F. Skinner, who, uh, according to most Psych 101 textbooks, puts the entire brain into a black box and doesn't care. But if you thoroughly read the work of, of Skinner, um, that's not quite true. It's, it's one of these myths about his life where it's not that he didn't care, but what Skinner was interested in, because he knew that the brain was complex, was treating a lot of this like some sort of mathematical function that you, you didn't know the function for, where he knew he could give an animal a certain input um, and he could create a certain output. And he was interested in trying to predict those things because he didn't have the right tools to necessarily figure out everything that was going on in between. So it's not that the brain was a black box he didn't care about. It was that it was a black box that was too complicated for his time. As we move forward, um, there are many, many pioneers in, in this time moving forward. Um, but David Rioche um, was someone who was particularly interested in the relationship um, between stress and major depressive disorder. And so he's one of the first that we can really uh, give some attribution to for emphasizing the need to take the anatomy of Cajal and the physiological methods of people like Hodgkin and Huxley and Eccles um, and begin using those to inform mental illness and psych psychiatric research. Um, and so he begins kind of creating these connections between what goes on in the brain and the different kind of mental illnesses that people might experience and begins bridging the worlds of clinical psychology or psychiatry and physiological psychology and neuroscience. Um, so this is a really important transition in time for us, not only beginning to think about the brain as a physiological organ and beginning to understand what happens. But as we start to move um, towards the kind of the late 1900s, we, we begin to see this is also a site that's very important for, for medicine in the clinic. Um, and we started with this with Broca, but in a very basic way. And so in, in order to begin attributing the complexities of things like mental illnesses, which for a very long time were kind of swept under the rug, um, to brain dysfunction um, is, an, is an incredibly important um, movement in the right direction and towards where we stand now. And so in some ways, if we look between the 1950s and 70s, which is not all that long ago, but might as well have been an eternity ago in terms of physiological psychology, because it was only 1930, 1935, less than 100 years ago, that we begin to understand how neurons were transmitting information. We didn't really have the full picture of this until almost the 1950s. And yet in modern neuroscience, we can do so many incredible things. We can sequence individual cells. We can take the those cells and we can understand not only their genetic identities, but how those genetic identities change, a process called epigenetics. Um, and that's really critical to starting to understand how the brain changes in disease states. We can also uh, cause cells to fire action potentials. We can trigger them with all kinds of new tools, one of which I have the picture for here called optogenetics, where we can insert light sensitive proteins into a cell and we can flash a beam of light and cause them to fire action potentials at will. And 
start activating parts of the brain in ways that we were never able to before, taking these ideas of functionalism into an entirely uh, new realm. And we can also record the activity of hundreds, thousands, if not even tens of thousands of neurons at the same time. Um, you can look at these data from people like the Allen Brain Institute or others, for those of you that are interested. Uh, so I, I'm taking the last 50 years and kind of condensing them into one giant ball right before all of your eyes. But the whole idea here is that we're in an entirely new era of neuroscience, which is driven by technology. And although um, our current COVID pandemic puts a bit of a damper on this, um, and has made getting into laboratories a little bit more difficult. Uh, this is also my way of encouraging you to seek out research, whether or not you're somebody who has a major in psychology or in biomedical engineering or any of these kinds of things that the lines between these, which may have been quite solid at one point in time, are um, no longer a, a clear line in the sand as they once used to be. And so you should you should definitely consider the ways in which neuroscience influences your field and vice versa. This is a very, very important uh, way that we all advance our science, our medicine, our understanding, and you can benefit from getting involved in the research and reading the latest research, whether or not you want to be a clinical psychologist or whether or not you want to be the type of person that's designing the new tools and technologies that influence the way that we look at the um, that we look at the brain. And with that, that is actually it for today. There's a whole lot more history that I could have included here. And for those of you that might have interest, I've actually included a couple of links in the slides here. So you're more than welcome to go explore. Um, but I wanted to start short just to get everyone kind of back in the groove of, of classes and things like that. So again, feel free to check out the links. Um, but the material here, just as a reminder, is is not tested. This is just something for me to give you a broad introduction and get us all on the same page of where we started in the world of neuroscience and the brain and where we are now. And that just about brings us to a wrap, but I am going to reiterate one last time. If you have questions, please stop into office hours. Even for me, some of these concepts are ones that I know off the top of my head, but others are ones that I am happy to look back up and go through with you if they fall outside of my normal area of expertise. There's a very, very broad range of topics here, and I know that they can be difficult. So find that time for office hours or send an email. Um, as I said in the very introductory lecture, one of the most important things across this semester is that we start out with a positive line of communication. And so this is my way of encouraging you, strongly imploring that you would do exactly that and that we we start out on the right foot. Also, for next time, we start straight into chapter two. And this is really, really important. We're going to be talking about the, the structure of the brain, the function, how signals are sent. And we take chapter two because it's so important. We break it down into three distinct lectures to be able to do this. So be ready for that and start reading that ahead of time. And with that, I hope everyone has a great rest of the week ahead of them. And I will catch you next time.